Good morning to everyone in Europe and good afternoon to everyone in China. My name is Jonas Rasch. I am communications officer here at the EU SME Center and I'd like to welcome all of you to the EU SME Center webinar series. With me here today is Klaus Ziegler who will be providing us with an introduction to product safety for consumer products in China. Just like in Europe, there are regular scandals in China involving products that do not keep what they promise with sometimes tough consequences for the companies involved. This has happened basically in all sectors from food and beverages to cars or mobile phones and customers are becoming more and more aware of their rights and the responsibilities of the manufacturers. This trend has been boosted by a recent update to the Chinese Consumer Rights Protection Law which included a significant increase in the penalties for the infringement of laws and the strengthening of consumer rights in general. An additional reason why this is important to European SMEs is that many of them have built their good reputation on the fact that they are providing safe and reliable products, which is something that Chinese consumers are desperately looking for since many of the domestic brands focus more on pricing than on quality. This differentiation is one of the main reasons why European companies are able to sell their products here in China at premium prices, so it should be in everyone's interest to maintain this reputation. This webinar will, will help you do that. Now, before Klaus will give us an overview of the existing regulations and tips on how European SMEs can manage the system, I'd like to take two minutes to introduce the center and our webinar platform. Um, as some of you might already know, the EU SME Center is a project funded by the European Union to help European small and medium-sized enterprises enter the Chinese market and maintain their activities here. We do this by providing advice and information on opportunities and challenges in the Chinese market as well as the legal and regulatory framework in China. This slide provides a little overview of everything the center has to offer. First of all, we divide our work into four different areas. These are business development, standards and conformity assessment, legal and HR. We have in-house expert teams for each of them and all of them together provide a range of different services. One of the main ones is the Ask the Expert service um, where companies can contact our in-house experts directly via mail or phone. Companies can also um, book consultations with us here in our office in Beijing to discuss any issue in more, more detail face-to-face. -face. We also publish sector reports, guidelines and case studies on a regular basis, all of which uh, you will be able to find in the Knowledge Center on our website at eusmecenter.org.cn. Um, there you will also find more resources on some of the issues that we will discuss today like, for example, a guideline on product liability or a report on corporate social responsibility. We frequently organize trainings and seminars both in Europe and in China. Take a look at our events calendar on our website to see what's coming up next. All of our services are free for European SMEs um, as well as intermediary organizations such as chambers of commerce, trade promotion agencies or embassies. To get access to all of them, please register on our website first. Now, just before we get started, I'd like to explain to you how you can ask questions during the webinar, which Klaus will then answer during the last 10 to 15 minutes. Since all microphones are muted, except for ours, you won't be able to communicate with us directly. So if you would like to post questions, please use the little box on the GoToWebinar panel that you see on your screen, where it says, Enter Question for Staff. Please send us your questions whenever they come up. Uh, we will collect them here and pass them on um, to the expert later. Any questions that we are not able to answer during the webinar um, will be answered via email uh, in the next few days. Now, right before his presentation, a few words about uh, today's speaker. Klaus is originally from Switzerland and has um, more than 20 years of experience in conformity assessment in Europe as well as Asia. He has worked in Japan and China, representing well-known institutions like the Global Testing and Inspection Body, SGS, or the German Standardization Institute, DIN. Since 2009, he is running his own company here in Beijing called Beijing Quality Partnerships, which advises companies on market access issues, quality management, and, or information security. 
we are very, very happy that uh, he has agreed to, to come here and share some of his ex um, experience and knowledge with us today. So without further ado, I'd like to leave the floor and the microphone to you, Klaus. Hello, my name is Klaus Ziegler. Um, I am talking today about um, a few issues related to um, the safety of consumer products in China. First, I talk a bit about the market, then about the regulatory framework, then I will go into some elements of the product safety system, and then probably the most important part of today, the practical guidance for SMEs, how to n navigate the Chinese system. At the end, I will repeat some key points and come to conclusions. Actually, um, I prepared also a few um, polls for you. Um, the first poll um, will be, um, actually should come up right now. Do you believe that the regulations, oh, I, need, I cannot see the text. Okay. Um, so you can see the text, so I cannot read it now. Um, do you believe that uh, the regulations in China become more difficult or not? Um, just answer this and I will come back with the um, um, results later to you. Okay. Um, Now, you, now um, sorry about that, now you can, can all see the results. So 80% of the attendees um, today say yes, they have been um, coming, becoming more difficult, and 20% are saying no, they have not been. Okay, um, to start, Okay, to start, um, I have listed a few um, points here. Um, first of all, about the reputation of Made in China. I think Jonas Rush already mentioned this. There is um, some suspicion about the quality of the products and the safety of products coming to China. Um, this suspicion is also clearly shown in all the statistics made, and especially also in the RAPEX uh, notification scheme where um, Probably the majority of all notifications seem to be to have their origin in China. Um, now, in all these uh, questions, always um, is the question: Who is to blame um, for these um, um, product um, problems? And as we know, it's always a lot of players together. Who once it could be the manufacturer, it could be the importer, it could be the distributor who should have known it or should have informed it, who should have stopped these goods from coming to the market. It's not that simple. Um, China itself has actually a quite um, um, well-developed, well-established system in place of product safety and control and supervision. Now, it just not always works that way it should. Um, and we have these scandals, we have it both in China, but we have it also in Europe with Chinese goods coming to Europe. Um, now, China claims often that also the opposite happens, that uh, foreign consumer products coming to China are not always compliant. And time and again, you can see um, notifications on the website of the Ministry AQSIQ, I will come back to that one, um, showing, demonstrating, um, European consumer products which do not comply with regulations are and thus are potentially dangerous. And I hope this seminar will help you to avoid such things because it's not necessary. If you are compliant in Europe, you can also be compliant in China, but you have to do a few things and to watch out for a few things to do so. I also want to warn you that China has an army of probably more than one million inspectors. Nobody knows exactly how many. So it's a good chance if your product is not compliant in China that at some stage somebody will find this and then you will have to bear the consequences. Uh, to, to start with the market, um, China is, as you know, um, the wealth of China is growing very fast. We have probably more than 250 million, probably 300 million consumers today who are willing also to buy foreign consumer products. 
So this is a huge market, it's one of the largest in the world already today and is still growing. Chinese consumer have a clear taste for luxury products. Um, it's shown, you see it both in China, but also if Chinese uh, go overseas when they go shopping, they usually buy also some luxury products. There is clearly an awareness for quality products and uh, as mentioned by Jonas, certainly there is always the question quality, quality against price. As every consumer everywhere in, in the world, Chinese consumer would have as cheap as, um, products as possible, but they should comply with their understanding of quality. European products have a special um, have a special advantage in China because they're considered well designed and safe. Um, this reputation we try to keep and maintain and it's very important that you, if you export any such products to China, that you also live up to this to maintain the branding of the European goods in China. Uh, the Western lifestyle has also influenced China in a way that um, many of the let's say attributes to Western lifestyle also link to consumer products. So these are becoming attractive in China. At the end of the day, I don't think there is any consumer products which cannot be sold in any other, in any way in China. It is really open to you to find the right marketing, to find the right groups, target groups in China, but the market is enormous big. Now to start with a few points to consider. Certainly the Chinese consumers anywhere in the world have the assumption how goods should look like, what they should do, how they should behave. And if you sell products to China, you certainly have to figure out what these assumptions are of the Chinese consumers and how they differ from a European audience. Uh, certainly the language is an issue. Whatever you do in China, you have to have your manuals in Chinese. You have to think about how you want to deal with the displays and displays who are not, at least in English or better in Chinese, will probably not be useful in China. All the logos, whatever you print on it, have to be in full conformity with Chinese regulations and understandable. So this type of thing, these adaptations you will have to make to your product. Localization it goes beyond um, just the language. Um, in some cases you face different standards, so you have to adapt to the standards in China. Different tastes, whatever it is, if the color system or whatever you use has to be localized. So this is certainly something you will have to think about. Then one of the things which I will, um, that's also the reason why we have this um, presentation, we have to talk about homologation. Propagation, that means the rules required to put your product on the Chinese market. The licenses, the certifications, the labels you need, these type of issues you need to put the product on the market. An issue which always comes up is IP and design protection. Certainly China has a scheme, a well-developed scheme in place and you, if you have questions on that please refer to the IPR help desk which is um, also here in the same house as the SME Center. And um, I, just, I just warn you, this is necessary. You will have to do it in China. And it's, uh, especially for IP, it's uh, first come, first served basis. So if you register your product first, you have a protection in China. Compliance with regulations is a must. I mentioned that before and the regulations are not always the same as in Europe, especially the standards are not always the same as in Europe. Finally, you will have to deal with customs regulations in China. Uh, here there is also the issue that this is a very, very big country. So you have many customs to deal with and even if the laws are the same, the local interpretation might also vary a bit and you have to be very, very well know which customs you talk with and basically try to not switch all the time. Stick to one custom you are familiar with and um, bring your products in through that gate. Good. There are also some 
regional differences in China as a huge country. You have uh, different geographies from flatland to high mountains. You have different climates. The whole south of China is basically hot. Um, and the north and the west of the country um, is basically dry. So it's, um, it's a, um, there are quite some differences within the country. So you cannot assume that one good which works in the south of China will also work well in the north of China. Then sometimes you need to adapt the good, whatever it is, to the geography. Then you have differences in climate, difference in culture as well. Um, uh, the language varies, even if the written language is the same all over the country, you have a lot of different languages in the country. Then what you have to accept that China has many provinces and these provinces are in the execution of the laws for product safety is basically on their own. They do, they implement the national legislations on their own and basically um, have their own way of doing things. So even if the law is the same, the implementation in the different provinces varies. You have, um, um, you have to deal so with all the different um, administrations in all the different provinces you want to sell your goods. And do not underestimate this work. It is really complicated, but treat the other way around. A Chinese um, exporter who has exporting consumer goods to Europe face exactly the same that each member states, each member state apply the same law but the local interpretation, for example, how market surveillance is done is different. That's the last point I have here. Market surveillance is localized in China. There is not a national market supervision body. The market supervision is done by the provincial governments. And the last word, and then I want to stop with this introduction, um, also in China, there are many channels um, how consumers can voice uh, their satisfaction or even more their dissatisfaction with consumer goods. There is a network of consumer hotlines all over the country. These consumer hotlines are linked basically to the local ministries, so it's up to them then to decide whether they want to react, but there is certainly a, a first official channel. Then the China is um, well organized in internet and social networks. So whatever rumor somebody puts in the internet on the social networks will spread very fast. So you can lose your reputation also simply through social networks in China. Finally, the broadcasting, there's, there are many local radio stations, TV stations. If they see something like a scandal of, with a consumer good upcoming, that's certainly something they are interested in and they will use this material. Good, I come to the next chapter. I'd like to talk about the regulatory framework. The pyramid you see now in the picture, um, you see constitution, law, administrative regulation, organization rules, and normative documents. That's the hierarchy. Important now for product safety, there is a national product safety law, unlike Europe. Europe does not have a, um, a national, a European product safety law. We have a law re addressing consumer products, but not a general product safety law. Many of the member states in Europe certainly have product safety laws. Um, most important here are actually not then the regulations and the ministerial orders in product safety. These are mainly addressing labeling issues but there's not like in Europe where you have for many product categories where you think there's a specific risk that you have a law, like a, um, for toy safety, for pressure vessels and so on. You don't really have this kind of um, specific um, administrative regulations or in Europe um, uh, um, regulations um, in China. So in lieu of these um, regulations, you have to normative documents, the compulsory standards and homologation rules. So if you want to see whether, if you want to check whether your product is compliant, you have very fast to go down to these normative documents and check these. 
I talked about the Ministry AQSRQ. Um, this is the Ministry for Quality and Supervision. There are not many countries on earth who have such a ministry, and especially not a ministry which is totally separated from the Ministry for Industry or the Ministry in Charge for Industrial Policies. This is actually a leftover of the old Soviet-style communist uh, way of running a government. It survived to today, and we have to deal with that, that this is kind of a one-stop shop for all services. So AQSRQ makes the standards by ICAC, they supervise um, conformity assessment by a CNCA, and they are in charge for implementation, like the inspection service via the local, that means the provincial, um, uh, quality bureaus, BQTS and CRQ. What you see in yellow on this slide are all these kind of institutes which are linked to AQSRQ, which are not independent, which are in a way administered by the ministry. This is, for example, the two main certification bodies, CQM and CQC. It's the main inspection body, CCIC, although it is a state company, a state asset company, it still has a strong link to AQSRQ. Then some of the very important industry associations like CCAA because they register all the auditors in China. So it's all in one ministry. If, if, I, if I can interrupt you just for a second here, I mean there's quite a lot of, <laughs> of ministries and, and bureau, bureaus and a lot of characters here on this slide. Now, does a European SME have to know all of these, or is there maybe one or two that are especially important and that's enough to know these, or is it really necessary to, to know your way around all of these different institutions? Yeah, very good question. Actually, I think for an SME, you have to know these three institutions on the right, in yellow, CQM, CCIC, and CQC. CQC will be the main body for your CCC system. CQM, um, is the main body for voluntary product certification in China, and CCIC is the institution in charge for inspection. Whether these inspections are done in China or, or in Europe um, for goods departing from Europe. So if you know those three bodies, I think you already know a lot. The administration itself, SAC and CNCA, you will probably not touch if you are not, if you don't have direct questions or issues with I just shortly would like to go with the hierarchy of standards. Um, uh, you see often that China has four levels of standards, national, then the industry standards, then provincial, and then enterprise standards. Now for the product safety, the provincial and the enterprise safety, uh, standard are not that relevant at the moment, especially not for an SME, but what you have to deal with is on national level, compulsory standards, both the national standards and the sector standards. And then related to that, the compulsory conformity assessment rules. These three things, so-called sub-administrative level, these are the law in China, and you have to comply with them. That's totally different from what we have in Europe with the harmonized standards, the standards, the standards which are harmonized with the legislation. Um, in if you use the harmonized standards in Europe, you have the presumption of conformity, but you don't have to use them. In China, it's different. It's a must, so you have to comply with these um, standards as a minimum part of compliance. It doesn't mean yet that your product is fully compliant with the legislation. You just have to do at least the standards and probably a few things more. Yeah, I mentioned at the beginning with this pyramid, if you remember that the product safety law, um, this, this law applies to all products which are processed or manufactured for sale. This definition leaves a few questions which nobody really can answer so clearly. What happens to things which are just gifts, donations? Or what happens with goods which you give to a client um, for a certain period and take back. For example, tools, 
to be applied um, for the goods you sold to them and then they take the, the tools back. So it's not so clear this definition but I think for consumer goods it's very clear they all fall under this product safety law. The, the points you see here basically are quite similar with what you expect in such a product safety law. What is important here at the end, um, it requests compensation for damage caused by defective products and it calls for penalties for violators and it also points out that forgery is forbidden. Okay. I would like to move to the next um, chapter and I think it would be probably good to have the next poll right now. If you could implement this. Can you see the poll question? asking whether you use the consultant or yes, great. That's developing fast. So it uh, looks like a very mixed picture that a part of you see clearly a need for use of a consultant of an agent that half of you probably will do by yourself. I think, I think we can close the poll now with this. Thank you. Yeah, let's continue about the product safety system, the key elements of the system, and I would need the next slide for this, if that is possible. Thank you. Um, you have here on the slide listed, you have the custom inspection, you have the administrative regulations, you have the compulsory standards, the voluntary standards, then you have all these certification, licensing and labeling schemes, the, what is called in general the homologation. Um, then you have a specific import licensing, which is then um, um, more specific to a certain good, to certain batches of good. Then you have the market surveillance authorities in the provinces and finally you have also something which probably only China has, export controls which applies for many, for many products um, in a certain way. Even if these um, export product controls have been reduced recently, they are still there and they are still a part of the system. I bring you an example of such a, um, um, of, uh, a certification scheme. This is the CCC system um, for all goods. I will explain it more in detail later. For all goods um, in the catalog, um, you need to have a CCC certificate before you place the product on the market. This officially such a process according to law takes 90 days. In practice it's much more because every time you start, um, the government comes back to you with a question, the clock starts again. So this can go on and on. Then there's an added complication that in case of the CCC, but also in many other such processes, the law requires um, a factory inspection undertaken by Chinese inspectors. So until these inspectors are scheduled, they have to write documents to travel overseas and so on. This can take a couple of months. And so the whole process, CCC, if you haven't done it before and you have no relation to it, can easily take six to eight months. But there's many more. I listed here some and on this page and the next page some of the systems um, you have to deal with. Um, one is the compulsory energy label. It's quite, it addresses similar products um, like the energy label in Europe. It is also the system is built on the same ideas, the same concepts and in some cases also on the same standards. It's something you have to deal with. It's the compulsory energy label I will explain at the end. I will address a bit more how this works. Then you have for telecom equipment the so-called network access license which is 
um, equally complicated as the CCC and comes often together with the CCC certification. Then you have for everything which is uh, emitting radio signals, um, for example RFID devices, you have um, the radio approval called SRC, and certainly um, the approbation of uh, medical devices and pharmaceuticals with the CFTA, that's the China Food and Drug Administration, then the homologation of vehicles. Vehicles are especially complicated as you need for the entire vehicle, both CCC and the homologation, and then you need special uh, rules to follow for um, environmental regulations for the exhausts. Cryptographic products need their own um, registration, then any environmentally sensitive equipment need an approval from the Ministry of Environmental Protection, then we have the pressure devices, pipeline and user installation with the CELO license, then we have an equivalent of the APEX um, regulation that's um, electrical products in explosive environment, you have this called CNEX in China, then broadcasting services related um, uh, products need um, as an approval, hygiene articles, cosmetics need an approval, um, mining products need an approval and many more. If you add all these, I just put you the whole list, um, you add up probably more than 50% of all product categories will need some kind of approval in China. Is there a question I should answer now or later? Good. A short repetition, we have the so-called pre-market controls, these are the certification, labeling and so on, all these um, issues um, we have mentioned before. So these are rules which are compulsory, you have to comply with before you place a product on the market. In Europe, this is totally different. In, this, in most cases, you have um, uh, you rely on as, um, the, the market is open. So basically, in Europe, um, the government relies on the producers that they are disciplined and only put products on the market which comply. China has a different system. The government will control what you put on the market. Post-market, Europe and China are quite similar. You have distributed Europe in member states, in China and provinces, you have the market surveillance authorities which will react. They will do random testing, but mostly they will react on complaints by competitors or whoever. Then you have this rapid system in Europe, which um, in China is building up a similar system within China, within the provinces, so if one product is considered suspect in China, that it's all over China also blocked. And finally, you have the export controls. Um, which is a special feature for China, which is mainly made to protect the brand made in China. So if you want to, for example, export toys from China, you have not only to get a special license for your production, you also have to have your goods inspected before export. All these market restrictions I mentioned are listed in catalogs, and these catalogs are kind of positive list. So if your product category is within this catalogs, within this catalog, then it applies. Now the catalog just lists generic product categories and the exact definition what falls under this category and what not, it's not so easy to determine. It's often not linked to the customs code, to the HS code, it's issued to other issues like standards or other regulations. Now here are some of the categories um, of catalogs. First of all, those who are prohibit, prohibited and or restricted. Um, certainly these are um, uh, goods which are often also prohibited or restricted in the European market. The, the goods which are dangerous, there are some um, poisonous products which are prohibited. Product, uh, for example, also depleting chemicals are partly prohibited and so on. Then we have products requiring a certificate of special license for, to be imported. A typical case is used machinery. Used machinery you can import to China, but you need a special license, individual for each product. Um, products requiring inspection certificate. Also here again, I can go to used machinery, they need an inspection certificate. 
but also other products, for example, if you want to ship um, um, waste for recycling in China, you need an inspection certificate for that. Products requiring importation license, that's a huge array of products there. It really, this is actually linked to the HS catalog. There you have to check for your product whether they need such an importation license. If so, then you have to find an importer who has this license. Another, yeah. another quick question from my side. Uh, first of all, um, can you tell us where we would be able to find these catalogs? And, and secondly, are they only available in Chinese or are they also available in English? Yeah, where to find? All over the place. Okay. <laughs> and certainly, um, some like the importation, the, the goods which, uh, for which importation prohibited and restricted, this catalog is published by Mofcom you find on the web page of Mofcom. And I've, it's also in the report about product safety you find this link. This is only available, basically available in Chinese only, but there are many translations of this catalog. Then products requiring a certificate or special license, for example, for CCC, you find the, an English translation. Um, for others, it depends. Some you find, some not. Inspection certificate and importation license, these are published by AQSIQ in Chinese only. These you cannot find. Um, yeah, um, what happens now if a product is not compliant? Uh, when asked this, is simple. It can be halted at customs, or if customs is not so sure about it, they will call the CIQ, that's a local um, inspection bureau, they will call them and ask them for advice, and if they feel that's a problem, it will be halted again by customs. If that happens, your product will be quarantined, and that means immediately long delays and a lot of cost because you have to pay for the storage time. In most cases, it's probably the best solution just to ship your goods back and try again. But that depends really on the um, goods. If um, it is, if the customs believe this is a serious case, uh, basically the product is dangerous then they can immediately order the destruction of the product and um, the import will probably also be fined for this. In less serious cases, um, as I say, the products um, shall be shipped back to the sender and if the sender doesn't do that, uh, doesn't want to receive them again, it will be dis uh, destroyed. Also this, the costs are for the import or for the sender. If the products are compliant if you can prove after quarantine you bring the right documents to show that they're compliant then they will be released for, for customs but that's a process which can take days or weeks or months depending on what kind of documents you need to provide if the product is not detected during the importation at the customs then it probably be detected by market surveillance activities what happens, the authorities will then, in simple cases, just request uh, rectification, what could be change of the labels or whatever it is, so you just have those who are still on sale you have to change, or will ask a stop from further selling, or if it's even worse, if it's getting more serious, then uh, China um, the law provides also the tools for product recall, and also what China can do is notify all provinces, so it's not only blocked in the province where the inspectors have seen it, it's also blocked all over China. What it means for a company, now not for the product, for the company means that um, CIQ will increase inspection regime if they find this company has a problem, whether it's now importer or one producing in China, the inspection regime will immediately be increased. They might ask for changes in production process in China. Um, you can have, uh, you can face fines or other administrative measures. And as is in, if you produce in China or you are an importer, you can also um, see you can also see your uh, production or importation license council. That means you are out of business. Now let's go to last place. Uh, part 
shall we have the, the third poll? This uh, third poll is about standards, um, how you deal with Chinese standards. I'll be interested to see whether it's an issue for you. I see some say also that they do not have to deal with Chinese standards, which I'm surprised. Um, but it can happen if the Chinese standard is identical with uh, the international standard, then yes, you're right, you can avoid bothering about them. Yeah, the picture is, it's not only a language issue, it's really also an issue of variations between the Chinese standard and the applicable European standard. Thank you for this. So let's continue. Here you have a list of questions you have to ask um, uh, if you want to go, if you want to be compliant to the product safety laws in China. First of all, you go through the catalogs. Now, if it's not clear with the catalog, you have to ask an expert. This expert can be your own company's engineer in China. He can be a consultant or he can be a testing lab you ask whether um, what they feel about it. So. This is not always trivial, this decision. Then the second is, um, does it fall under the law of product quality? As I say, there are only a few exceptions um, through the definition of the law. Then, does any compulsory certification labeling scheme, labeling scheme apply, like CCC? Also, this is not always trivial. Also, there you often need an expert. And in addition, what is also important here, if it's not clear for you whether it falls under certain regulation, it's probably also not clear for the cost for the customs. So it is worth then adding some documentation to show, to prove why you believe it doesn't fall under certain regulation. Such a letter is ideally provided um, not by yourself, by a third party, um, since China has a system of third party controls and not really, or government controls and not really of self-declaration. So if it's possible for you, try to find a third party who um, makes an attestation for you that they believe for this and this reason this product doesn't fall under this um, specific scheme. Then the standards, we mentioned that, the voluntary and compulsory standards for the product then what you always can think about is voluntary certification in China. That's a, that's a marketing issue, whether um, it is helpful for you to use this voluntary certification system, if it's helpful for your market in China. Finally, um, it's the import and export. I mean, for you, it's import controls, whether it's under this catalog. Um, this is not that important for you because basically your importer should know. But if you are importing yourself, then you have to check this list. Um, and if there is any, um, and the final point is the product documentation itself. As I say, the manuals have to be in Chinese. The product documentation has to be similar as you would need um, on the CE marking. This type of documentation you also need to have ready um, in China. Um, then it is also the important that all the labels, logos and so on are compliant with Chinese regulation. I have um, uh, in a few uh, additional comments about some um, specific um, product categories for electric and electronic household products. Um, for many of these products, you need CCC. Uh, for example, audio, video equipment, ICT equipment, handhold tools, washing machines, and so on, white goods. So it does several, a lot of um, categories in household goods which need CCC. So you have to look very carefully for this. In addition, this radio approval, network approval for um, telecom equipment, 
and also if it's somewhere in um, in, in areas which need explosion protection, you need to see CNEX approval. The good thing is that China is part of the IC. CB, ICE, CB scheme, that's um, a certification scheme where the certificates are recognized by all those members of this IC, ICE scheme. That's an international agreement. Most countries um, have bodies which are signatory of this ICE scheme. So these are also accepted in China, but only for the low voltage part, not for the EMC. But still, this, re this CB scheme and the related technical reports are very valuable for the CCC registration for household for electrical household products. In some cases, also useful to use um, voluntary product certificates. Toys. China has two standards for toys: one for um, for, for normal toys, and then one for electrical toys. Both are related to the respective ISO or IC span standard, but not equivalent. So there are major differences and you have to check this. For some toy products you need CCC, electric, plastic and metal toys, then some non-toy products like child carriers, launching toys, dolls, um, uh, you need also CCC. No CCC is needed for toys made out of paper, wood, textile, glass, ceramic toys um, and other categories. Again, the CC catalog just lists electric, plastic and metal toys, which, which is not always clear to define what falls under this. Now, the compulsory energy label, it's basically a self-declaration. It requires testing in China. There are currently, I think, 29 product categories. Um, somewhat 60 standards related to this. The authority in charge is CNIS, the China National Institute for Standardization. If you do it yourself, this is also one of the institutions we'll have to deal with. Um, the compulsory standards define also the minimum energy performance um, levels. So there you have to go to standards or to the, um, the implementation rules of the label. Importantly, also you have to make an annual submit an annual report about numbers of products sold under this label. I come to the conclusion. Some key points to consider: um, you have to be familiar with the key elements of the system if you want to import goods to China. You have to properly document the safety of the goods, of the products. On requests, you have to, you need to be able to produce that within due time. You have to pay attention to the details of the documentation because of a lot of these schemes are, are compulsory schemes. That means these are government approved schemes and what this requires is um, a watertight documentation. So everything on this is, is linked together, everything is um, compatible with each other in the documentation. These type of things are very important for these compulsory certifications. Standards used in China, they are often different, so you need to know the differences and whether they affect you. And the simple rule, compliance in you does not imply compliance in China. It is often the case for Big majority of the products is the case, but not always. Or you have to make small amendments to be compliant in China. To conclude, the system is very different from Europe. Compulsory standards are the key to compliance. Um, many uh, requirements are similar, but not always. You need to have expertise on the ground in China to find, to navigate the system. And this expertise can either be your own company engineers or it can be something you buy. It can be the distributor. Um, it can be many um, different sources. If you use the distributor for this, you just have face the problem that you give a lot of your technical information to your distributor. Um, 
if you use your own engineer, you need to have senior engineers in China, not just a junior who can fix a few tools. Time to market. Um, all these compulsory market access schemes um, need time. Um, as I say, for CCC can be up to eight months. For medical devices, is often to 18 months. So these are these you have to consider when you start your marketing in China. And the costs are not always negligible, especially for small series. Let's, for example, an example, simple example, designer labs. You want to sell 500 of these per year in China, then these costs are really um, not negligible. Eh? A CCC can easily cost you for one model uh, 10,000 euro. Um, it depends a bit on the product. Impact not only importer, but for the employer supply chain. Um, if you have a homologation issue in China, you probably you are better off to, just to change your supply chains that you can avoid this homologation issue that you have to consider. I mentioned that registration through the distributor is always to be taken to be careful. It's certainly the the fastest way to do so, but you risk that this distributor has more information that you wish him to have. Finally, um, all these processes are not uncontrollable, but you need somebody who has expertise with these processes to get a grip on it, get a hold on it, to understand what's going on, what steps, and how long it takes. With this, I would like to conclude, and I'm happy to go to the questions. All right, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Klaus, um, for this very, very informative um, um, presentation. I think it contained, well, a lot of useful information. And yes, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, we will do a little Q&A session now. Now, the first question is fairly similar to the question I just asked earlier. It concerns standards. And I think I already kind of know the answer to that question, because the question is, where would European companies be able to find all of these um, standards? Is there like a, a central organization where you will be able to find them? And once again, are they available in English? And also, are they available for free, or would you have to pay for them? Yeah. The standards um, are, you can find um, the title of all standards in the various uh, databases. One is um, the EU, the, the Chinese European Standard Information Platform. You can find the websites both in, um, in the documents to this uh, the, uh, presentation, also on the website of the USME Center. Um, on this website, you, find, you can find the titles of many Chinese standards, both national and industry standards, translated to English. It's only the title. But still, it's a first level of search, which you can get support. For the national standards um, in China, there are also other databases where you can find the titles of the national standards translated. SAC has um, an internet shop. SAC is the Standard Administration of China, has an internet shop, maintains one, where you can find, buy download all the Chinese national standards. The compulsory standards are for free. These you can just download there. Then the voluntary standards, you have to pay a fee. Although for Chinese standards, the fees are much lower than for standards in Europe, you still have to pay this fee to get these. They're also copyrighted. Chinese standards are basically not available in any other language than in English. Um, if you need an English translation and it's important for your products, you at the moment you have no other choice than to translate it by yourself. So give it to an expert for translation. Okay. For the oh, sector standards, it's more complicated. If you need the standards, you have to figure out which body is issuing this standard, is printing this standard. And they will have a website and there you can download it. But that's individual from each um, sector. Each sector has different points. Okay, so the next question concerns uh, the CCC mark. Um, now, Bernard is asking if you need a complete CCC process before um, you are allowed to ship samples to China. For example, if you want to attend a trade show here in China, do you need a CCC mark for your, for your sample or, or not? The principle is that CCC is need 
for, needed for any product which falls under the catalog. Now, there are a few exemptions. And one is certainly um, for exhibitions. For official fish exhibitions, you can use the Gameata, and with that, it's no problem to import the product temporarily and export it again. Then there are also a few other um, exemptions. One is if the product is made in such a way that it cannot be used for anything else than for a large machinery, and it is immediately built into that machinery when it arrives in China, then you can probably also get an exemption. Then there are certainly for testing, to obtain the certification for this testing, you need also exemption. But that's about it. All the others are very difficult to obtain, and China is very restrictive with these exemptions. Okay. And um, another question on the CCC mark. If you have a family of products that are basically technically um, identical, but maybe have like small changes to each other, do you need the CCC mark for each individual um, of your of your products, or is there like kind of like a group CCC basically? Yeah. There is no group CCC. The group the CCC is individual for each type. Now you can have within a type certain variations, or you can have a master type, and then the, let's say all the members of this master type have just a little bit less less functions than the master type. This is possible, but this has to be discussed individually and there is no generic answer to this. Mm -hmm. But generally, each model, that means if it's really technically different, needs its own certificate. Okay. Um, now, another question from Jörg on product documentation, because you mentioned in your presentation that documentation is really, really important and that you need basically to document everything. And uh, he's asking if there's any source of information or any, any checklists or anything like that where you can make sure that you have all the documentation that's necessary before you actually approach the Chinese authorities. Or and the most important source is always the standard itself, the respective standard. If that has some indication what has to be documented, that's obviously the first source. Then the documentation which is needed for any compulsory scheme is then laid down in the documentation in the rules of this um, certification system. For example, for CCC is very clear what documents you have to provide. Now, for products where you don't have a compulsory certification, that's what I say. If you create a product safety documentation which is similar to what you would use in Europe, then you're probably on the safe side. As I say, important is you have to have all manuals in Chinese. You have to have you have to be very careful about any kind of screen showing any text that this is, if possible, in Chinese or at least in English. And the logos, they have to follow the Chinese logos, which are different from the ISO logos. Okay, so we are almost out of time, so unfortunately we have to stop here with the questions and ask, um, answers. As I said before, any questions that we have not answered just now uh, will be answered via email in the coming days. Uh, should you have any other questions concerning product safety in China in, in the future, you can also obviously contact our in-house experts um, by, via our website. Um, all of our webinars are recorded, so if you would like to rewatch this um, at some, um, some other time, just go to our website as well and you will find the recording there. Um, once again, thank you Klaus for your informative presentation. Uh, I'd also like to thank all of you for attending this webinar and for your active participation in the polls. Our webinar series continues tomorrow at the same time. That's um, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. In, in Central Europe and 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. in China with a webinar on the green building components market in China, which is also organized by our standards and conformity assessment team. If you would like to sign up for that one, um, also once again go to our website, um, have a look at the events calendar and there you will find the webinar and then just click on the link and sign up. Now just uh, right before we log off, just one quick request. As always, there will be a, a quick survey after this webinar and we'd very much appreciate your feedback. That's all for today. Thank you very much and goodbye.